Personal Injury Court. Good day, everyone. This is the matter of McGuire versus Brooks. It's my understanding, Ms. McGuire, that you are suing for injuries you received when a nail gun shot a nail through your head. Yes. You're suing Mr. Brooks for those injuries, and you have $300,000 in medical expenses, $200,000 for future medical expenses, and $1.5 million for pain and suffering. You want this court to award you $2 million against Mr. Brooks. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Brooks, it's your position today that had Ms. McGuire waited for you and not been in the wrong place at the wrong time, this would have never happened, and thus this is not your fault. True? Yes, Your Honor. Now, let's get into the legal sauce. Now, Ms. McGuire, tell me, uh, how did you come to even hire Mr. Brooks? Yes, Your Honor. So, I am a musician. I okay. play the bass guitar and the ukulele for my indie rock band. I fool with a sax every once in a while. Hey, maybe you could join our band one day. <laughs> uh, so, I was headed on a three-month tour around the country visiting different bars. We had some sold-out um, areas, sold-out concerts, and I hired Mr. Brooks to build a recording studio in my home on the second floor. After the three months uh, had passed, I was really excited to see the work that Mr. Brooks had done on our recording. Did you studio. think it was going to be done in three months? Uh, I was told that it was going to be near done when I got back. And Mr. Brooks, tell me about your company. How long have you been doing construction? Well, Your Honor, I've been in business for about 25 years. Long time. And basically, yes, yes, Your Honor. And basically, for the last five of those years, I ran my own business, a bag of bricks remodeling, as a remodeling contractor. How, how long does something like this normally take? Well, it depends on the extravagancy of uh, the project. Uh, she wanted a state-of-the-art studio put in. So okay, she was going to do it right. Yeah, she was going to do it up. She was going to do it up. So. And so how long was it supposed to take in your estimation? Well, in my estimation, we should have been done about three, three and a half months, four months tops. So, Ms. McGuire, take me to the day that uh, this happened. What happened? Yes, Your Honor. So I arrived home. Um, I walked up the stairs in my house uh, and walked through a plastic drape. And I immediately stubbed my toe. Natural reaction, you know, you, you bend down to make sure that everything's okay. And, and where are you in, in your house? Where I am are on you? the second floor of my home. Okay, at the entrance of the studio? At the entrance of the studio, yes, and Your Honor. So then what happened? So then I stood back up, I turned my head, and I immediately bumped into something. I didn't know what it was, but immediately it, it was just this excruciating pain in the right side of my head. It, it felt like a bomb had exploded inside my head. I thought I was having a stroke. I wasn't sure what was going on. Somehow, I was able to pull my phone out of my pocket and dial 911, um, and, and the next thing that I I remember I woke up in the hospital, and that's when the doctor told me that there was a three-inch nail that had pierced my skull. So this is the actual nail that pierced my skull. It went in uh, right here in my temple behind my eye, and then it pierced up through my optic nerve and into my brain. And, and your you honor, must have I been am, scared out of your wit. I was scared to death, and, and now I am completely blind in my right eye. Sheriff Matt, could you get the nail? Let me see it. So this nail went into your eye? Yes, this, Your Honor. This was sticking in your head? That was what the surgeon pulled out of my skull. That's your head, Ms. McGuire? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Brooks, what do you call this kind of nail? Well, it's a galvanized nail. Okay, it's an industrial nail, isn't it? Yes, sir. So you had an industrial nail sticking in your head while you're trying to make a call? Yes, Your Honor. I believe it was shock. So I was able to call 911, um, and I, I actually you... did bring a recording of that tape, Your Honor. Well, let's hear that. You've submitted it to the court. Let's hear the 911 call. 911, what's your emergency? I, I, I have a terrible pain. Please, please help. It's in my head. It hurts so bad. Please help. I can't move. Hello? Ma'am, I'm still here. What's your address? Ma'am, you said you have something in your head. Hello? Hello? So, so when this cuts off, what happens? Uh, I blacked out. Apparently, there was blood everywhere. Miss McGuire, is that your blood? Yes, Your Honor. So, Mr. Brooks, tell me how you knew something bad had gone on. Well, Your Honor, basically, I pulled up and saw Miss McGuire going into her home, and uh, I yelled out to her, and she continued to go into the entrance of her home. And so, she looked like she was in a bit of a hurry. I, I imagine that maybe she had to use the bathroom or something like that. So, okay. I pulled in, gathered my notes, grabbed my fold, and I went in to uh, meet her upstairs uh, to the uh, top of the entrance. And when I got up there and went through the plastic draping... That's what did you when... see? That's when I saw. 
That's when I saw Mrs. McGuire laying in a pool of blood. And, so she's and lying on the floor. She's laying there. She's got a nail in her head. She's I, passed out and her blood's all over the floor? Well, Your Honor, I don't know what's in her head. I just see her laying in a pool of blood. And it, it just shocked me because she just came in. This had four, to freak five you ago. out, too. Yes, this sir. To I was shocked. I, didn't, I mean, so I grabbed my phone and I called 911. Did you know what had happened at that point? I had no idea what had happened. I'm trying to figure out. She just walked in the house. But you called 911. I called 911, sir. Now, Mr. Brooks, you, you see, this is pretty bad stuff. This is a bad injury, right? Oh, yes, sir. I empathize with her. And it, and it was your nail gun. Uh, yes, sir. It was my Your gun. nail. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Her injury. Uh, absolutely, Your But, Honor. but you absolutely. tell me today it's not your fault. Tell me why. Well, Your Honor, we had an agreement to meet at her garage. You did? At 1.30. Okay. At 1.30, and that way I can safely navigate her into the home. Okay. Now, she never mentioned a time. How are you so sure? I have text messages here, Your Honor. Okay. I have text messages that we Sheriff Matt, if you'll get the text this agreement. So you all had an agreement to, to meet at 1.30. Yeah, and she and actually showed up early. I'm looking at what you've submitted to this court, this text message that says, and I guess you're in the blue, it says, hey, things are coming along, when are you coming home, question mark. Yes, sir. And then in the gray, Miss McGuire, it says, my flight lands tomorrow at noon. I take it that's you. You remember this, right? Yes, Your Honor. Then in the blue, you, Mr. Brooks, you say, perfect, meet me in front of the garage at 1.30. 1.30. And then, Miss McGuire, you say, great. See you there. You understood y'all were going to meet at 1.30. Yes, Your Honor. And that right? is where the text yes. message and so, ended. So now, if, had she followed your instructions, take me through how this was going to happen. We we're going to go over the notes. I'm sure that we made the changes that she wanted to make. And then we were going to go into the construction area, safely into, so I can navigate her through. I know the hazards. I know the dangers. I know the phase that we had at that time. If she would have only waited. I see that you have submitted this uh, text message. You know, in courts, often it is a uh, one word against another word. Yes. It's always important to have documents. Yes, sir. You remember you were supposed to be there at 1 30, right? Yes, Your Honor. Y you came a little early? I arrived maybe five minutes early. And had you met him there at 1.30, he could have guided you through the house. I didn't know that I needed to be guided through the house. That's the point that it's I'm trying to make. He says, let zone. me get through what I'm talking about, Mr. Brooks. Okay. He told me to meet him there at 1.30. I get there. He's not at the garage. I expect maybe he has already gone inside. This is inside. not 1.30. Well, 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 there was no car there, right? For him. His car wasn't there. I don't know what kind of car he drove. So you don't take any responsibility for your injuries? I do not take any responsibility for my entries, okay. no, Your Honor. I know you've been through a lot. I know you've been through a lot, but you do understand that had you come at 1.30, at least he would have been able to guide you through. But I was not made aware of any of the dangers of a construction area. Now, you are asking this court to award you $300,000 for past medical bills, right? Yes, Your Honor. And you're also looking at $200,000 for future meds. What kind of uh, future meds did you have in your idea of what's going to happen? I need therapy. Uh, I need for this to completely heal, which I'm still going to have to go to multiple doctor's checkups. Still got a long road ahead of you. I've got a very long road ahead of me, yes, Now, Your you're, Honor. you're also asking this court for $1.5 million for pain and suffering. Yes, Your Honor. There, there are a couple of different kinds of pain in every personal injury case. There's the pain you feel, your body, your head, your eye, and then what's on your mind and your heart. Uh, this is devastating. I, like I was saying, this has been my dream since I was seven years old. I'm having to cancel shows. I don't get the money for canceling the shows. This is my livelihood, and it is being completely taken away from me. I will never be able to see out of my right eye again. That's what your doctors are telling you. That is what my doctors w have said. Will you have to wear a patch? I mean, your, your eyeball is still there, right? My eyeball is still there. I will have to wear a patch for a good amount of time. It's not a pretty sight. I'm going to be honest. There is a nasty scar there. Now, it's an understatement to say nail in the head. When this nail went into your head... It went through my skull and into the fluid that is surrounding your brain. So it was sticking in the compartment where your brain is. Yes, it fractured my skull when it went into my head, Your Honor. So you, you do see, uh, Mr. Brooks, she's been through a lot and still got a lot to go. Regardless of whose fault it is. Absolutely. Do, do you yeah. feel badly for this? I feel terrible. I, I hate this incident even happened. So this must have broken you up, too. 25 years, I've never had anything to the extent happen. Never.
and really, Your Honor, to, to really be honest, she really wasn't properly dressed to go onto an active construction site. Well, I know I wear a robe to come in court. Is there something and you're supposed to wear in dressed, your construction honor. site? You're properly dressed. What's she proper dress? Not. Well, when she came into the... And we have pictures. I, I did bring a few pictures. Okay. Okay. okay, now, basically... Tell me what we're looking at here on the plasma. Your Honor, look here. But this is just coming up. This is just coming in. Look at all of the debris here. Look at all... There's things that... There's hazards that you can trip. She comes on the job site with flip-flops on. This is not a toe injury, it's a head injury. I understand it's the head injury. Okay. But if you're coming into a construction site, there's all kinds of things around. There's wood, there's nails sticking up out of wood. You gotta there's be prepared. All, you have to be prepared. You need a hard hat on. Well, how would she get a hard hat? Because before you actually get up to the stairs here, yes, there's sir. a bin at the entrance of the door when you come in that has all kind of personal protective equipment in it. Okay. Hard hats, glasses, gloves, anything you need to come in. And again, we would have been able to put those things on. You can return to the podium, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Uh, Ms. McGuire, did you see this big bin of hard hats and glasses? No, I did not. I was looking for the defendant, Your Honor. We keep talking about this yellow elephant in the room called the nail gun. Is that the nail gun that shot that nail in your head? Yes, This Your Honor. Is the nail uh, gun, Your Honor. It's a nail gun. Yeah, you can put it down there. I don't want you to shoot my sheriff here. Oh, no, no, Your Honor. What's that do that, uh, that helps you at a construction site? Well, basically, it, it, it's, it's a rapid fire uh, a nail gun. That way you're not hammering. Hammering is old school. So basically, it's compressed with air, and you can press it down okay. and shoot it off. It will not shoot off if it's not pressed down. Okay. I wanted to learn more about how this gun functions, how you handle it. So this court uh, hired an independent general contractor who knows a little something about construction sites. His name is Jeff Lupton. Sheriff, could you get Mr. Lupton in here? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Lupton, come on in. Thank you, Your Honor. For the record, state your name, please. Uh, my name is Jeff Lupton. Mr. Lupton, what do you do as a general contractor? Uh, I do residential and commercial uh, additions, renovations, uh, build-outs. How long have you been in construction? I've been in business for 22 years. Mr. Lupton, how dangerous are nail guns? You see this nail gun on the uh, podium there? Yes, how sir. dangerous are they? Uh, they're extremely dangerous. Why? Uh, basically, uh, the way a nail gun uh, works is with a, a compressor, electric compressor, that compresses air to uh, 120 PSI through that hose connected to the nail gun itself and through bursts of high pressure air basically shoots, uh, shoots the nails out at a really, really high velocity. I understand you brought a couple of videos. Yes, sir. I did. Can, can you walk me through those? Absolutely. Kind of give you an example of, uh, of kind of how a, a nail gun would be used actively on a site where you're, where you're putting two pieces of wood together and some framing. And again, you can see that the nail just goes through there easily and that's two uh, three quarter inch pieces of, uh, of pine. If it shoots a nail through wood that easily, it must go through a human head like peanut butter. I would imagine so. It's pretty intense. Now, Mr. Lupton, Mr. Brooks testified that if the plaintiff had been wearing a hard hat, that hard hat would have protected her from this nail gun. Well, uh, while using safety equipment is always important on a construction site, a safety hat wouldn't necessarily have, have protected her directly from it. And we, sh we have an example here of a three-inch nail uh, going right through. It goes through the hard hat. hard hat. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Miss Brooks, you saw that video, right? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, seems like that hard hat wouldn't have stopped us from getting here today. True? <laughs> uh, yes, Your Honor. If I think you did a good thing as a business owner to provide those hard hats, Absolutely. but they're kind of for bricks and things falling, right? Absolutely. Folks, I think I've heard enough. I'm ready to render my decision. Every personal injury case, the plaintiff must prove that the defendant's wrong caused your injury. Here today, Ms. McGuire, you have shown that you could not have anticipated that a nail gun was loaded and ready to change your life waiting inside. This has affected your life, affected your life as a musician, and hurt you emotionally. It's a permanent injury, and that's why you're seeking a huge award from this court. Mr. Brooks, you tried to do what was responsible. You told her what time to be there. You told her to wait for you at the garage so you could walk through and escort her past the danger. But this happened, and this is why we are here today. Ms. McGuire, I find that you have proven that Mr. Brooks was wrong and that his wrong caused your injury. However, the evidence shows that he wasn't wrong by himself. You were wrong also. You were responsible for your injuries partly. Here, 
You are asking this court to award you $300,000 for past medical bills, $200,000 for future medical bills, and $1.5 million for pain and suffering for a total award of $2 million that you seek. Because I find you 49% responsible for your injuries, I'm only going to award 51% of what you are requesting from this court. So I find in your favor and against Mr. Brooks in the amount of $1,020,000, and that is my final verdict. This matter is adjourned. Our attorneys across America just viewed this case for the first time. Let's hear what Hoyt Tessner has to say. In every trial, the plaintiff must explain and, if possible, demonstrate exactly what happened to cause injury. Expert testimony and the video show just how powerful and dangerous a nail gun can be and demonstrate the extent and severity of Ms. McGuire's injury. This case shows how important it is to use power tools safely. Safety should always come first, especially around construction. This is Personal Injury Court. Good day, everyone. This is the matter of Madison versus Connor. Mr. and Mrs. Madison, it's my understanding that you, Mr. Madison, sustained severe injuries to your eye when a pitchfork destroyed it at an event on Mr. Connor's farm. It's my understanding that you are seeking past medical expenses of $600,000, future medical expenses of $300,000, and pain and suffering for $1.1 million for a total award of $2 million. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And uh, Mr. Connor, your position in this case is that he knew what was going on. This is a freak accident that's not really anybody's fault, but certainly not yours. That's correct. Yes, Your Honor. All right, well, let's get into the legal sauce. Now, you all used to be buddies, right? How long have y'all known each other? Well, we met back in college, Your Honor, and we used to hang out all the time. We had many conversations, and one of those led to charity, and that's how we, we came up with the idea to enter into the barnyard games. Now, barnyard games, what are barnyard games? We modeled this around anything you might find laying around a barnyard. Okay. And we tried to come up with interesting activities to do with those tools. For instance, uh, rake relay and the garden shear toss okay. and pitch ball. You all are throwing tools around? Yes. Okay. And, and you said it's a charity event. Who's the charity for? It's for underprivileged kids. Okay, that's a good thing. Each donor that comes in, they pay a flat fee. Okay. To enter the games, and then 75% goes to the charity, and we keep 25%. And Mr. Connor, you remember these barnyard games that you and Mr. Madison came up with? I thought the charity was a great idea. I mean, it, it's, it always gives it back to kids like I grew up. I, I didn't have a whole lot growing up, and, that, and that's what made us come up with it, but I agreed to host it, and it was on my grandfather's land. He's got 100 acres. It's perfect for this kind of event. This is your grandfather's farm? It is. I grew up there. I've, I've had a lot of fun there as a child. So tell me what happened on the day you got injured. On the day of the event, a large crowd gathered around, around the pitch ball field. And by pitch ball, what do you mean? Okay, so pitch ball is exactly like baseball, except you use a pitchfork as a bat and a soccer ball as the baseball. Okay, yes. okay. So what happened? On the day of the event, the crowd gathered. They were excited for the game. We started playing. I started pitching the first few pitches. And the defendant here swung at one of those pitches and smacked the ball. The pitchfork vibrated in a way that I had not heard before. It, it made a metal on wood sound that it just didn't sound good. We continued on after I warned him to take it easy again the second time with him swinging with all his might, like he was going for a home run hit or something. So then that's when the pitchfork actually broke on impact. And then what happens to you? And then I see the end of the pitchfork flying towards my face, and it made impact. I felt the bone crush on impact. I felt the piece of metal slide into my eye socket. Michael, I said I was sorry, and I've tried to help. I'm not sure, Mrs. Help. Connor, you saw this. You saw your buddy get hit in the face with a pitchfork. Yes, I did, and it scared me to death. I thought I killed him. I ran to him immediately. I hollered for them to call 911. I did what I could. I Mr. Madison, you help. remember him being 
concerned about you? Your Honor, I was in unbearable pain. I, I didn't know who was screaming. I was, I was bleeding. I couldn't see out of my right eye. Your Honor, there was a conversation prior to the games that day where we had noticed that some of the equipment was older and the defendant had said that he was going to replace the pitchfork. And, and you were there for that conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I overheard the whole thing. Look, I, I did say I was going to replace it, and I, I did forget. But I also said that we did not have to play this game. There, there was other games that we could have played, and I did tell him... We could skip it. So, Mr. Madison talked about this sound when you swung the pitchfork and hit the ball. Did you hear that sound? I mean, it scared me to death because the tie broke off and it flew into his eye. And I... So, so Mr. Madison, he hears the crack, you hear the crack. Why didn't y'all just stop? Because we had everyone out there, sir, and he had already agreed to take it easy before the game even started. Okay, so, so I reminded Mrs. Him. Madison, you remember him saying, I'll take it easy? Yeah, I absolutely overheard my husband tell him to take it easy, and he said that he would, but he was too busy trying to impress some girl that was in the audience. I wasn't... Well, Mrs. Madison, do you remember Mr. Connor coming to care after his friend? Honestly, I was in such a state of shock seeing my husband collapse on the ground. I thought my husband was dead on the ground this in front of me. This is a freak accident. I did not hurt nobody on purpose. This, this wasn't a freak I accident. I wish this on my worst enemy. This but was not... So you, you were frightened, too. replaced it. When you saw the pitchfork hit Mr. Madison in the face, you were frightened. I thought I killed him. The ball was coming towards me. He threw it. He was smiling. I was smiling. Everybody's having a good time. He threw the ball. And I swung, and as soon as it made contact, I felt the pop. I heard it, and immediately after I heard everybody scream, it just happened so fast, and I was, it scared me to death, and I ran to him. I didn't know if I killed him or not. I didn't know what happened. So when you swing, that pitchfork comes off the end, it comes flying and hits him in the face. You're at home plate watching this. Yes. So then you run to his I aid. ran straight to him and I screamed out. I told him, I said, call 911. Now you've got a pitchfork here. Was it that kind of pitchfork that you were swinging? It was. On the plasma here, we've got a picture of what looks like the pitchfork. Is that what hit you in the eye, Mr. Madison? Yes, Your Honor. Is that, is that your blood on that uh, pillow there? Yes, Your Honor. <laughs> Next, we have an x-ray. This is your head? Yes, Your Honor. So this pitchfork destroyed your eye. I have lost my eye, Your Honor. That x-ray could make you pretty nauseous, I imagine. Does for me. I can't imagine the pain. Mrs. Madison, I see you cringing. What, what was going through your mind when your husband's lying there with this pitchfork sticking in his eye? Well, my first thought was I didn't even know if he was alive or dead. You can see the length of that. I don't know if it's just in his eye, if it's gone all the way through his skull. I have no idea. Yes, ma'am. I mean, could you even imagine seeing your husband laying on the ground in front of you? For all I knew, I could be at his funeral today instead of yes, here in court. Look, we so was all at risk when we played, though, and I tried to help him. I, no I one would have been at by risk. His side. How, how did you to try to help him? I did everything I could. I worked and tried to give cash towards the family to help them with the expenses. I did what I could. Mr. To Connor, try to this help. sounds like this breaks your heart too. He's my best friend. We've been through so much together. This is truly a tragedy. <sighs> this truly is not tragedy. my fault. If he was it was his idea the whole time. Did you know, Mr. Connor, that this uh, pitchfork was bad? I did, and I told him I would replace it, but. I also told him I forgot, and I told him that we could play anything else. What he went to was, this is his moneymaker, and he kept repeating that. He wanted to play for greed. So, Mr. Madison, if you knew that the pitchfork was concerning, why did you continue? Because he had agreed to take it easy. Because he had failed to get the new pitchfork. And did you take it easy? I was playing to win. But it wasn't... He wasn't important. playing to win. He was playing to impress a girl from the audience. I was not impressed. Well, that, listen, listen, guys, that, that touches me. We men have gotten to a lot of difficult spots trying to impress a woman, okay? <laughs> Miss Madison, you saw this swing. Yes. How do you characterize you it? You would think he was trying to hit it out of Fenway Park. You would think he was playing professional baseball. I was playing for my charity. This It's for charity. People had already paid to be there. They weren't going to pay more just because he hit it harder. At the last Barnyard Games, there's not really a winner other than the kids, right? Right? Exactly. Right. How much did you all raise in the first Barnyard game? So 370000 wow. That's real. Congratulations to both of you for doing such a good thing.
I've been a Santa for 20 years. Beard, makeup, everything. The kids think I'm a superstar, but I get more out of it than they do. So giving back is very important. <laughs> Mr. Madison, you have asked this court to award you $600,000 for past medical expenses and $300,000 for future medical expenses. I want to get the doctor in to tell us about your injuries and what we're looking at. So let's get Dr. Neelam Vaughn in. All right, yes, sir. Good day, doctor. How are you? I'm well. How about yourself? Could you state your name for the record? Dr. Neelam Vaughn. Doctor, describe the nature and extent of Mr. Madison's injuries. Well, first, he suffered a traumatic brain injury, but not one where you can't walk or talk or do for yourself, but one where it basically stunned his brain, like a concussion. And secondly, he ruptured his globe of his eye, so he totally lost his vision and has to have the eye removed. You can see how close that pitchforker is all the way here, and your brain is just right there. What are the long-term effects, Doc? Well, there's retraining yourself how to drive, how to walk. There's intimacy issues between he and his wife, and you know, just socially going about with one eye missing, it, it really does affect you. Thank you, Doctor. We appreciate you. My you pleasure. are released. Thank you. Mrs. Madison, an injury to a husband is an injury to a family. Tell me how this has been for you as the, as the chief of the family caring for your husband. It's been a nightmare. I mean, since day one, obviously he's very disfigured. Um, but it, it's not just the physical parts. Obviously, she said, you know, there's balance issues. There's the fact that he can't do the things that he loves to do anymore. But really, the mental side effects of that are are so much worse. He's depressed. He doesn't want to leave the house except to go to doctor's appointments. I offered for us to reschedule and postpone it. You know, I, until we could have got another pitchfork. I offered for us to play anything else. This whole thing could have been avoided. Exactly, and he pushed and pushed. This is I his didn't money push maker. Anything, Mr. Your Madison, honor. were you pushing to get this done this day? Not at all. He had months to I get this new equipment. Said, he had months to get the new equipment. But on the day, on the day of the swing, did you push him despite hearing this pitchfork? I did not push him. Sound? The only thing I said is, I will agree to play if you agree to take it easy because you're using an old pitchfork. Like I was saying, he had months to get the new equipment, and he failed to do so. And then on the day of the event, after we have hundreds, almost a thousand donors there, then he tells me he don't have the right equipment. So this happens in front of the donors with yes. hundreds of people there. Yes, after we sent out flyers and posted on social media about this, then he tells me that he failed to do the one job that I gave him. Your Honor, there is only one person at fault here, and it's the defendant for his recklessness. Y'all could have stopped this, right? Exactly. When you heard when he you heard the, the pitchfork make the sound. He was True? the one who swung it. It was not in anyone else's hands. But before he swung it, you, you all could have said, hold on, that made a weird sound, right? We did say we that. We did, and we stopped him. And Mr. Connor, frankly, you heard the sound too. You could have stopped said it. That we could play any other game. This is what he wanted to play. He kept saying it's his money maker. That came out of his mouth. That was his word. I was here for the charity. I was here for the children. He was here for the greed and the money. That is what got him hurt. That is a He's desperate a victim plea. of his own greed. Whatever. That is it a is desperate plea from a guilty man. I could be on the other side of this. I, I know it's important to you. I, I can see it on your face. Mr. Madison, Mrs. Madison, you all are asking this court for $1.1 million for pain and suffering. Yes. Tell me about that experience. That's a lot of money. From the day that it happened, it's been nothing but trauma. Not just physically, but emotionally. I mean, my wife doesn't even look, doesn't even look at me the same anymore. Your Honor, our entire lives have changed because of this. This is not just medical injuries. He's going to have these for the rest of his life. We were talking about kids, and now that's not even, that's not even a concern right now. What, what's your daily experience like with having one eye? I, I, I can't balance. She has to walk me from place to place. I, I reach for things, and I, and I miss them. Like, like, as simple as reaching for a cup of coffee and I'm, and I'm a foot off, and then looking in a mirror and seeing a nasty, empty hole where I used to have a, a nice eye. And you blame your best friend for this? Yes. How about you His negligence about the help is what got us here. Since he's been hurt. Tell me about the help you provided to your I friend. Have, I have given money to help with bills since he currently can't work. If he needs errands ran, I try to help. It sounds like he's trying to make a good case for you, Your yeah. Honor. 
A few hundred dollars towards bills. We have six hundred thousand dollars so accident. far. Mrs. Madison, think about this. What's the biggest change in your husband since he lost his eye? Probably his confidence. Every personal injury case, the plaintiff has to prove three things. The plaintiff has to prove that the defendant was wrong and that the defendant's wrong caused your harm. This was an event that should not have had y'all meet me today. You all thought that swinging the pitchfork was going to be a safe thing, despite the uh, cracking sound. You thought he was going to take it easy. Even though he told you that he was going to replace it, you knew he didn't replace it. But if he took it easy, this would go fine. Instead, what you all have said is he swung too hard and the top of this pitchfork came off and destroyed your eye and changed your life forever. Mr. Connor, your heart was in the right place. You were concerned about this pitchfork, but not such that you thought it would harm your best friend. I know you didn't intend this. You did this event with Mr. Madison before. You all as buddies have done a great thing. You were playing just like you had played before. But the law does not require people to intend the results of an act. What the law requires is that no one suspend their common sense and that you intend to do the act which causes harm. If that act is reckless, then despite your heart, your relationship, your feelings, the law would hold you responsible. You had the last act in the chain of events that caused this injury. Because you swung too hard, I must find against you. I find in favor of the plaintiffs, and I'm going to award you $600,000 for past medical expenses, $300,000 for future medical expenses, and $1.1 million for pain and suffering for a total award of $2 million. That is my final verdict, and this matter is adjourned. Our attorneys across America just viewed this case for the first time. Let's hear what Hoyt Tessner has to say. Two key facts turned this case for the plaintiff. First, as the pitcher, he assumed only the risk of the defendant hitting him with a soccer ball. There was no way for him to anticipate that the batter would swing hard enough to break the pitchfork. Also, Mr. Connor had promised to replace the old pitchfork and get a new one for this event. Mr. Connor failed to do so. The plaintiff got forked. is Personal Injury Court. Good day, everyone. This is the matter of James versus Sutton. Mr. James, it's my understanding you're suing Miss Sutton for injuries that you sustained while you were at a music festival that Miss Sutton put on. You're asking this court to award you $10,000 for your past medical expenses, $5,000 for future medical expenses, $20,000 for lost wages, and $250,000 for pain and suffering for a total award of $285,000. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And Ms. Sutton, your response to this is very simple. If he had left the music festival when everybody else did, he never would have been hurt, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Well, let's get into the legal sauce. What brings you to a music festival? I would recently won a contest via the radio that granted me a ticket along with a backstage pass. Okay. For a meet and greet VIP after the concert had ended. So I drove separately to meet up with my friends and stayed about an hour and a half after the concert before I was preparing to leave. Okay. Now, Miss Sutton, you put on music festivals. Yes. I'm, Tell me about them. Sure. I've been in the music and entertainment industry for over 20 years. We do loads of outdoor festivals. They're always sold out. They're very popular. Um, as a matter of fact, all the radio stations love them. All we kinds of music? Them. Absolutely, all kinds of music. I oversee and I manage all of the logistics of the venue, the artists, the parking, and all the surrounding public areas. So from the piano to the portable toilets, you manage it? Absolutely. Okay, so you're getting all kinds of people, but pretty much some of the things are the same. People have to use the bathroom, right, at Absolutely. a festival? Absolutely, which we provide as a courtesy to our attendees. Okay, you ever had a problem with your portable toilets before? Never. So, Mr. James, tell me how this happened. Well, Your Honor, 
Uh, I was staying after the concert about an hour and a half. As anyone else would, it was granted a backstage pass. I was hanging out with the band, enjoying myself. Had a few drinks, yes, had something to eat. So as I was preparing to make the long ride home, I elected to use the restroom and a portable toilet that was placed right near the parking lot. As I entered the portable toilet um, and attended to my business, I was sitting on the toilet when all of a sudden I heard a truck fire up. Okay. And I noticed you heard the engine of the truck. Yes, sir. That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. Didn't think anything of it at the time. Um, figured they were leaving the premises, doing their job. Noticed it getting closer before I noticed a loud thud. Okay. Immediately knew it was occurring. Um, dreaded the situation as I saw it happening before my eyes. The portable toilet topped backwards, slamming into the ground. I immediately snapped my neck, whipping my head into the ground, which caused the concussion. I was covered in not only human waste, but also this blue chemical from the portable toilet. Head to toe, in my mouth, in my nose. It was mortifying. Uh, if you can only imagine, throughout the entire days of this festival, the entire night, uh, you gotta think, I was one of the last ones there with my backstage pass. The so the toilet people, was full. The amount of human traffic that had entered into that toilet before I entered in it. It, it makes me want to throw up just to imagine, as you can see. Constant human traffic in and out of there before I'd entered. That's a lot of folks. That's correct. And a lot of use. That's correct. I have to admit this. There have been times I've been in one of those portable toilets and I see that stuff down there and I say, what if you fell in there? I guess it's no longer hypothetical. This yeah. stuff was all over this you. This will be the last time I ever use a portable toilet in my life, Your Honor. So, Ms. Sutton, obviously you want folks to use the portable toilet. Yes, of course. H how do you protect against somebody pushing it over and knocking it over? Well, we've never had that incident. And as you can see, they're, they're situated on a level ground. Okay. I wasn't advised of the, in, of the situation until about a half hour after it occurred. Although it's very unfortunate that this happened to him. And we're extremely sorry, but we didn't do it. Well, but this isn't his fault. You're not saying this is his fault. He was simply trying to make a deposit, but right? Was Sounds he? like she is, right? But own. was he? He was there long after that concert and the festival had ended. So he talked about being there with the band. Uh, why'd you stay so late? No one told me I was supposed to leave the premises, Your Honor. I had no, no one warning me of any time I needed to leave. I had no one warning me that these portable toilets were in danger of using. So uh, to my knowledge, they were there for the use of the customers as they always were the entire day. Your well, Honor. doesn't most of the people leaving kind of give you a clue it's time to go? I was enjoying myself. Your Honor. <laughs> It's not every day you win a contest like this, Your Honor. Yes, this sir. was, I was using my right However, with this VIP backstage pass. Your Honor, I've submitted yes, as an exhibit our concert schedule. It's our official schedule showing that the concert ended at midnight. Yes, ma'am. Let's take a look and at it. And this here. gentleman here, this incident took place at 2 a.m. This is the concert call sheet. So people try to stay on schedule with this, right? Yes. So absolutely. 11 p.m. is final set. And then 12 a.m., that is midnight. Yes. Wrap strike venue. Is that when folks are supposed to leave? Well, that's about when the meet and greet is. 15 minutes max. Those artists are tired. They played all night long. They do a quick picture of the handful of people that had the backstage pass, and they are out of there on their road. And by 2 o'clock, all my people are gone. It was not two hours after the concert ended. It was an hour and a half max, just so <laughs> we're clear. You do acknowledge, though, that you stayed quite a bit after midnight, right? Not the time, not, not the time frame that she is exhibiting here. That is incorrect, no, that's not true. She's well, lying. what do you remember? How long did you stay? It was an hour and a half max, Your okay, Honor. So and that, like I said, no that one- That takes you to 1.30, to right? Friends. Correct. Okay, now is it that weird that people stay an hour and a half, Miss Sutton? Oh, absolutely, especially because our parking lot was 95% empty. Well, 95% means that... Uh, the other 5% was probably my employees. And okay. And maybe him and his friends. So tell me about your injuries. Yes, Your Honor. I, on impact, I suffered whiplash and a severe concussion from my head smacking the ground. Along with being covered with this blue chemical, I was covered in human excrement, which gave me hepatitis A. So some of this stuff got in your mouth and your eyes? That and is, I was head to toe, Your Honor. Head to toe, completely covered. 
and I could not avoid hepatitis A, which has caused my skin and my eyes to turn yellow. Yeah, your, your medical records that you submitted show that you were jaundiced and had quite an infection. That's correct, Your Honor. I've been in severe pain since the incident. Um, aside from the neck brace, the hepatitis A has caused severe liver pain. My eyes, like I said, have been burnt yellow. My urine has turned the color of coffee, Your Honor. Well, your medical records indicate that your internal organs were definitely affected. That's correct. So it sounds like, though, the hepatitis is worse than the whiplash. That's correct, Your Honor. Miss Sutton, a portable toilet getting knocked over, that is an odd event for one of your concerts, correct. right? Correct. And it, but nonetheless, this is not our fault. He should not have been there at this time. It's not your fault. Uh, that's your excuse? That is your excuse. We Talk didn't knock it over. Folks. We have no idea who did it. Well, it happened at your event. Sure. In yeah. one of your portable toilets. He clearly didn't do anything to knock it over. I don't know. Your Honor, who she he needs to take responsibility for this. For we everything have... that's occurred to me. We have parking attendants directing traffic 45 minutes after the concert ended. And as I stated, that parking lot was 95% empty when this happened. Your Honor, I received no verbal, no sign warning that these portable toilets were in any danger of using. Because they were If I had, I would not have used them. You're asking this court to award you a quarter of a million dollars for pain and suffering. What's been the worst part of this? To be honest, I think that quarter of a million is taking it easy. The worst part has been being covered in human excrement with my pants at my ankles. It was the most mortifying moment of my entire life. Mr. James, you mentioned hepatitis A. To understand this disease, this court has consulted Dr. Asma Khalid. Sheriff, will you get Dr. Khalid? Yes, Your Honor. Hello, doctor. Will you please explain the nature of the disease that Mr. James contracted in this accident? Hepatitis A is a virus that's highly contagious. It's usually spread person to person, fecal or route, such as changing dirty diapers or handling contaminated foods. So the liver is located in the upper right quadrant of your abdomen. It's essentially a huge filtration system that takes blood from your body and filters it through the hepatocytes, which are liver cells. Blood passes through, takes foods and nutrients as well as toxins or bacteria and virus. Now the hepatitis A virus passes through the blood, filters through the hepatocytes, but once it's inside the hepatocytes, it infects the liver cells and causes them to become inflamed. They obviously don't handle that very well, and you develop some scar tissue, causing the whole liver to become inflamed and enlarged. So why does your skin get yellow? It's basically called jaundice. Okay. And just like, you know, a newborn has jaundice, and the hepatocytes release uh, a chemical, and it basically spreads through your blood, causing your skin to turn yellow. Doctor, thank you. You are released. Thank you. Your Honor, I can say with 100% confidence that Miss Sutton is 100% responsible for what happened to me. Mr. James, how do you know that one of Miss Sutton's employees hit this portable toilet? Your Honor, I have a diagram to explain how the incident occurred in the parking lot. All right, well, let's put your diagram up on the plasma. You submitted that to the court. Why don't you go over and show me how you think this happened? Upon entering the portable toilet, that these two trucks were placed right here okay. before entering. As I did, I heard this truck fire up and then immediately began to reverse back towards me. How did you know it was in reverse? Circumstantial evidence, The beep, your and Honor. I could tell it was getting close to me, Your Honor. This is here. Okay. It got louder and louder. So that backup beep got closer to you? Correct. All right. And it was before I could even put it together that all of a sudden it hit this portable toilet, knocked it on its back, and which then I slammed into the ground following it. This is and all immediately was being covered. Immediately was covered with human excrement. He has wits. absolutely no proof that it was one of my trucks or a truck now, at all. Now, but hold on for a minute. These trucks weren't concert goers, right? No. They were production. This wasn't a trucker's convention. My production trucks were parked out in front, but towards closing, they began to leave. So I kicked my way out, almost like my own coffin, Your Honor, covered in this waste, managed to pull my pants up and realized the truck was completely gone off the premises. Now, for the record, Miss Sutton, all six of these trucks that were on that diagram are your production trucks, right? Correct. Driven by your employees, correct? Correct. For all 20 years, we've been doing this and never had an issue. That's hearsay. You cannot 
have him have that photo in there. He has no idea that was one of our trucks. I'm confident, Your Honor. Like I said, I distinctly remember two trucks being placed in front of the portable toilets. As I exited it, there was only one. You can return to the podium. You keep throwing a around the term circumstantial evidence. Yes, because he's, he's giving us evidence that he says, I know for a fact without a fact. Well, let me tell you about evidence. In a courtroom, there are really two kinds of evidence. There's direct evidence and then circumstantial evidence. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking that circumstantial evidence is of a weaker, less reliable source. It is not. Circumstantial evidence is direct evidence that indicates a certain fact. For example, if a person walks through the snow and you see them walk through the snow, you can testify, I saw someone walk through the snow. That's the direct evidence. However, if you go to that same snow and you see my size 13 footprints all the way up to my motorcycle and I'm sitting on the right. motorcycle, that's circumstantial evidence right. that I walked through the snow. They are of there equal value. There is no proof that I did. We have a natural barrier of our trucks placed out so no accidents like this would happen. Natural, there was no natural barrier. There was no verbal, no sign warning of any danger using these. Park in front of the portable toilets to act as a shield, preventing anything to interfere with them. I was covered in literal human because of her, Your Honor. Be human waste and this language. blue chemical. Be careful about your language. I understand what you're covered with, but we got to call it a different name. Folks, I think I've heard what I need to hear. I'm ready to render my decision. When I was a young lawyer, I used to think that lawsuits were simple, particularly personal injury lawsuits because all the plaintiff has to prove is that someone did something wrong, that is, you'd have to prove Ms. Sutton did something wrong, or one of her employees, and that their wrong caused your injury. Hardly ever does it turn out to be simple in the many cases I presided over. But this one is simple. You're responsible for your employees' actions under a doctrine called respondeat Superior. It simply means that the master must answer for the actions of the servant. Here, if your driver backed into that portable toilet, you pay the bill. Let's look at the evidence. We don't have direct evidence of who backed into this portable toilet. But the circumstantial evidence is this. While you're sitting in this portable toilet, you hear a truck engine fire up. Correct. That's a very distinct sound. You then hear the beeping, the reverse safety signal of the truck backing up and it's getting closer to you. And your portable toilet flips over and so does your life. That circumstantial evidence is superior weight of who backed into this portable toilet. I am convinced it was one of your employees that backed into this toilet. <laughs> And because of that, I find in your favor, and I'm going to give you everything that you asked for. I'm awarding you $10,000 for your past medicals, $5,000 for your future medicals, $20,000 for your lost wages, and $250,000 for your pain and suffering for a total award for you and against the defendant for $285,000. That's my final award, and this matter is adjourned. Thank you, Ryan. Our attorneys across America just viewed this case for the first time. Let's hear what Hoyt Tessner has to say. Here, Judge Gino cites the legal principle of respondeat superior. This Latin phrase means the employer is responsible for his employee. There was no direct evidence that the employee backed into the portable toilet, but there was circumstantial evidence. The law considers circumstantial and direct evidence the same. The plaintiff saw the truck, went into the toilet, heard the truck engine start, followed by impact. Afterwards, no truck. 